My name is Larry McCullough. I'm the press director of the Hall Institute of Public Policy, New Jersey. Um, and our executive director, Michael Rickards, will be up shortly to tell you more about the Institute. I just want to say thanks for coming. And I want to really thank Rutgers for, for, for being our partner presenting this, particularly uh, the Center for Latin American Studies at Rutgers University. Um, and they've been uh, just great to work with and, and really helped in, in you know, getting the message out here. Uh, if this is your first time here, um, the, the restrooms are around down the hall and to the right and then to the left. Um, and uh, there's also where the Cook Cafe is, where there are you know, lots of good food. Um, so at any time you need to, to refresh yourself, go ahead. We're going to have people, I guess, drifting in and out all day, um, or at least till about 1 o'clock. And um, we have three panels, as you know, in your program. So we'll just get started. I would like to introduce our uh, host, Dr. Laura Schneider, the Center for Latin American Studies. Good morning, everybody. Uh, um, okay, I'm Laura Schneider. I'm uh, the director for the Center for Latin American Studies here at Rutgers, and I'm also an associate professor in the Department of Geography. And on behalf of Rutgers, I want to welcome everybody this morning to this really, really exciting event. Uh, I, I was just really pleased that uh, Lori, Larry was able to, you know, reach us uh, and tell us about this, 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 this. Uh, idea that he had and, and, and the possibility of bringing this important issue in New Jersey and do it here at Rutgers where we are extremely interested in, in, in connecting to, to, to uh, Latino communities in, in New Jersey. I mean, we have been doing this, this for a while. So I'm, I'm really happy and excited about, about uh, this event today. And, uh, and I want uh, you know, to welcome everybody again here to Rutgers. And, uh, and, and hopefully you will have a morning of very good discussions, interesting discussions. And, uh, and, and we can do this uh, uh, you know, in the future. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is just to uh, introduce uh, 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 Michael Rickers from, from the whole Institute of uh, Public Policy to, to also say a few words about, about the event today. And, uh, and again, I just want to welcome everybody and bienvenidos. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to have the opportunity, first of all, to be back home again. It's good to be on the Rutgers campus as a proud alum. Uh, secondly of all, I bring the warmest greetings from our founder, George Hall, who unfortunately couldn't be here this morning. Uh, the Hall Institute was established by Mr. Hall about seven years ago to look in a nonpartisan uh, way at the major issues affecting both New Jersey and as one of the most demographically similar states to the whole United States. And so if you go on our website, you'll see what we've been investigating over the last seven years. We have our own TV shows, which are also, you can go in on, on our website and pick them up, our own radio shows, and we've published over 400 articles on the uh, major issues that uh, approach uh, what we think are important for us. About a year ago, I said to Larry that I really wanted to do a series of conferences, and one of them that I wanted to do would be on the question of Hispanic and Latinos and their future in New Jersey. What are the important issues? Not just to treat them as a voting block, which seems to me is what is done over and over again, but what are the genuine issues of concern to the Latin American populations, to the Puerto Rican populations, to those people who have been in the United States, to those who are relatively new. What is essentially the state of the union for Hispanics in, a, in our state and in our nation? This is going to be an important issue, I think, of course, during the presidential campaign. And when this conference is over, I'm going to write an article. It's going to be an open letter to the two candidates for president of the United States, saying, based on our experiences and based on our conversations that take place today, this is what we think you should be focusing on. Not the kind of 30-second commercials, but this is what it's like for people who live and work and raise children in this country. These are the issues that we think are important. And the Hall Institute for seven years has been trying to do that. We've raised concerns about 
the pension crisis in New Jersey. And I got an awful lot of angry people from state government and who said that we were turning against our own state. And now, of course, what we've said has become the standard questions that come out of the legislature and out of the governor's office. We've been terribly concerned about the rights of the disabled, and that has really led to some major conferences. And again, some people have been critical about the whole question of why we are dealing with those problems when we have so many others. And we've been looking at a variety of questions, and we'll continue to put those forward. Please go on our website. It's simple. It's just hallnj.com. So we hope that uh, you'll enjoy this conference. I hope that you'll enjoy other conferences. And I hope that you'll help me write an open letter to the next president of the United States on behalf of Hispanic and Latino peoples. So on behalf of the whole institute and the wonderful work that Larry has done, on behalf also of my relatives, some of whom emigrated to places like Colombia and Argentina, I say welcome. Thank you. We have two great keynote speakers here today, um, and one is going to give a national perspective and the other one more of a, a New Jersey perspective. And our New Jersey perspective keynoter is uh, Professor Robert Montemayor, and he's going to actually serve as the official MC here today. I am. <laughs> so <laughs> he'll keep a tight ship running. Hey. So um, here he is, Robert Montemayor, a former thought... Pulitzer Prize winning journalist uh, from the Los Angeles Times who is now here in New Jersey. Okay. Thanks very much. Nothing like surprises. Uh, let me introduce the, uh, the first keynote speaker, and then I'll come up and do uh, New Jersey. Is this thing on? I, I, it sounds like I'm, I'm talking back to myself. Um, the first keynote speaker is a fellow that I, uh, I've been reading uh, uh, about and, and reading his information for years. Uh, he is uh, an individual who works at the uh, Pew Hispanic Center based in Washington. Uh, he does uh, a lot of great work in terms of demography, uh, being able to size you know, up the market uh, in national terms, also in regional terms. Uh, Pew, uh, if you don't already know it, and it's not a well-kept secret, uh, they're one of the leading, if not the leading organization in the country uh, that uh, really does you know, the, the kind of work that uh, a lot of people look to and you say, did you read that Pew his report today? Uh, and most recently, this week, in fact, um, uh, as the director of the Latino Information Network here at Rutgers, I found out that uh, my organization is badly named. Uh, he came up with an organization, a story that said that uh, Latinos don't like to be called Latinos. They like to be called by their, their, their country name. They prefer that. Uh, and they prefer Hispanic to Latino. So with that, we were in the process of changing the name as of this morning. As of, no, no, I'm not going to change it. It's, but uh, he, he'll, he'll probably touch on that as well because that, that drew a lot of comment, uh, a lot of you know, blowback uh, on him and the Pew, most of it positive. Uh, but that's what the Pew does. The Pew does you know, great work in this area, and, and Mark is one of their best writers. Uh, you know, they've got a, a, a stable of people. Uh, who think, you know, both from a journalistic point of view and also from a, uh, uh, an academic point of view. They, they marry the two together uh, and they produce great reports. So I, uh, I introduce you to Mark Hugo, Hugo Lopez uh, from Southern California, Princeton graduate and uh, member of the Pew Hispanic Center. For that, uh, thank you for that great introduction. Um, I, I, as we're as we're waiting for the uh, for the for the slideshow here to start, let me first uh, say a couple of things. Um, I'm with the Pew Hispanic Center, uh, and the Pew Hispanic Center is quite unique. Uh, we refer to ourselves not as a think tank, but actually as a fact tank. 
which means that we don't take any positions on policy, we don't make any policy recommendations, we're not on advocacy, we're just about providing information. And I'm going to show you a lot of uh, information today uh, based off of Pew reports and uh, a lot of it documenting national trends. But where possible, I'm going to highlight how New Jersey compares or where New Jersey stands compared to other places. Now before I get started with my talk, one thing I wanted to say is that I actually created a hashtag on Twitter. Uh, the hashtag is uh, uh, State of New Jersey, state, state of Hispanic NJ, State of Hispanic NJ. So I've tweeted a couple of times already today. So if you're tweeting, uh, you might want to use the same hashtag so that we could all sort of keep keep this all going at the same time. So all right, well let's get to, let's get started. So first, let me tell you a little bit about the demographic story. The demographic story of of Latinos in the United States. Um, now, when we talk about the Hispanic population. It is a population that has a number of demographic stories in it, but of course the big one is its growth. When we talk about this population, as you can see, since 1980 the population has grown from 14.6 million to 50.5 million today. Now 50.5 million is actually kind of a nice round number if you think about it, uh, and it's an important milestone. Uh, today, Latinos are the nation's largest minority group. Um, in fact, they surpassed African Americans as the nation's largest minority group uh, in the early part of the last decade. Um, what's also interesting, however, is that where the growth is happening, and this is another part of that demographic story, where the growth is happening is it's happening in places that you might not have thought of. This is a list of the states that had the fastest growth in their Hispanic populations during the last decade. As you can see, many of these are in the southeast. South Carolina, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky. What's interesting about this list is the state of Georgia. Because Georgia, um, at the beginning of the decade, had about 430, 440,000 Hispanics. Now it's about 850,000. So in some cases, even though South Carolina started at a low base, a place like Georgia actually started with a substantial base. And now Georgia is one of the nation's 10 largest Hispanic states, which may surprise you because you oftentimes don't think of Georgia, for example, as a top 10 Hispanic state. To give you a sense of the distribution of this growth, you can see where the fastest growth happened. The yellow states are states where we had more than 90% growth, so almost a doubling, if not more, of those state populations of Hispanics. But notice that New Jersey, New Jersey is in this light color. It had one of the slower Hispanic population growth rates, but it is also one of the larger Hispanic population states. You can see California is just like New Jersey, it's in the same color. California has the largest Hispanic population, but it didn't grow quite as fast as it did, as the Hispanic population did in, say, South Carolina. Nonetheless, this gives you a sense of where the distribution is. A lot of the growth happened in the Southeast. Now, some facts from the census, some fun facts. When people go with me to a, to a uh, dinner or we go out for a cocktail, people always laugh at me because I have facts in my head and they wonder what I'm forgetting if I have all these facts. Um, so I don't know. Well, let me throw some facts at you because these are fun facts from the census. Um, first, in New Jersey, there are about 1.6 million Latinos in New Jersey. That's how many were counted by the 2010 census. That makes New Jersey the seventh largest Hispanic state in the country. The number increased from 1.1 million in 2000. So that's a pretty fast increase, not quite the same as South Carolina, but pretty fast. And in New Jersey, <coughs> Hispanics make up 18% of the state's population. Looking at other parts of the country, the Latino population in the U.S. is concentrated primarily in two states, California and Texas. Those are the biggies. And nearly half of the, of the nation's population of Hispanics is in those two states. What's interesting, however, is that that share, 46.5%, is actually lower than it was in 2000, which was lower than it was in 1990, which is lower than it was in 1980. What's happened over the decades is that the nation's Hispanic population has dispersed around the country. And even though California and Texas are still dominant, they are not as dominant as they were just 20 years ago. What's interesting, though, about where I'm from, and of course I have to plug where I'm from, um, Los Angeles County, uh, is that Los Angeles has the nation's largest population of Hispanics as a county. So there are 4.7 million Latinos in LA County alone. As you can see, that's more than there are in the entire state of New Jersey. And nearly one in 10 of all the nation's Hispanics are in Los Angeles County. So Los Angeles County has the nation's largest Hispanic population, and it has about one in 10 of all Hispanics. 
And perhaps most interestingly, I think, is this fact. Did you know that there were one million more Latinos counted than had been expected? Now the Census Bureau generates population estimates. And the population estimates going into the census suggested that we were probably gonna count about 49 million Hispanics. We counted a million more than that. And a lot of this difference came from places in the southeast. Those fast-growing places, uh, oftentimes the estimated population in 2009 was substantially below the actual count that happened in 2010. And so a lot of places that were smaller, like Alabama, South Carolina, ended up having more Latinos counted than were expected. But it's interesting because this is a, the, the census really revealed a lot of very fascinating facts about the his, nation's Hispanic population. Now I want to give you a sense of how things have changed. This is 1980. The, you can see where the distribution of the Hispanic population is. It's in the Northeast, it's in the border region, it's in South Florida. Watch what happens as we go through the years. So here's 1990, here's 2000, and here is 2010. As you can see, the Hispanic population has dispersed around the country so that now there are population centers in places like Minneapolis. Look at the Atlanta area. Look at the state of North Carolina. What's interesting is that North Carolina in the 1990s, we would call it a new destination state. Well, in the office now we call it a old new destination state uh, because there's so many other places that you see the Hispanic population growing. But even in Alaska, we've had growth in the nation's Hispanic population. Um, to show you the largest states, as you can see, I've had New Jersey here highlighted, but you could also see Georgia there on the list. Georgia is at the bottom of the list, number 10, but it is catching up fast to New Mexico, which is an old Hispanic state, which has nearly a million Hispanics. But you could also see that California alone at 14 million is a standout, followed by Texas at 9.5 million, which is also a standout. Now, I also wanted to show you something, because I know we're going to have a discussion today about the nation's unauthorized immigrant population. The Pew Hispanic Center does an estimate of how many unauthorized immigrants there are that live in the country today. And this is a trend showing you, this is a chart showing you the trend in our estimates for the number of unauthorized immigrants. Now, I want to stress this as an estimate. That's why we have bars to indicate that there's a margin of error. We don't know for sure how many unauthorized immigrants there are but we, we produce an estimate based off of government data sources and information about border apprehensions and, and some sense of how many people are, are crossing the border. At the moment, we estimate that there are about 11 million unauthorized immigrants in the country, down from a peak of 12 million in 2007. Of course, for New Jersey, New Jersey, we estimate, has about 550,000 unauthorized immigrants in 2010. That number may have changed between then and now. But you'll also notice that New Jersey is the fifth largest state in terms of its unauthorized immigrant population. So when we talk about unauthorized immigrants, while California and Texas dominate, you'll also notice that there are unauthorized immigrants in every corner of the country. One thing I'd also stress is that when we talk about unauthorized immigrants, about 80% are from Latin America. So about 80% are Hispanic, but 20% are not from Latin America. They're from other parts of the world. So not all unauthorized immigrants are Hispanic. Also, among the nation's unauthorized immigrants, 60% about are from Mexico. So Mexicans dominate the numbers, but again, they're not all unauthorized immigrants are Mexican. Now, I also want to tell you a few other stories. And I want to tell you a story about youth. When we talk about the Hispanic population, the nation's Hispanic population is quite young. And it is also uh, 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 representing a greater share of today's children than it was, say, in 2000. Today, nearly one in four of the nation's children, people under the age of 18, are Hispanic. In 2000, it was 17%. So you can see that Latinos make up a larger share, not only of the nation's population, but particularly among children, they represent nearly one in four of all children. In 2007, they made up one in four of all of the nation's births. Now you can really see this youth for Hispanics if you take a look at age pyramid <coughs> profiles. You can see that the Hispanic population's got a nice pyramid. That's because it's younger, and its median age is about, is about uh, uh, 27. Next to it, you've got the white non-Hispanic population, and its median age is more like 42. So there is a si significant difference in terms of the age distribution of Hispanics versus others. But what's most striking is when you compare native-born versus foreign-born Hispanics. Foreign-born Hispanics are mostly adults. As you might expect, those are the folks who are probably going to immigrate to the United States if they're going to make a decision to come here. 
Um, the median age for native-born Hispanics, however, is 14. So it's a very young population. As we move forward, we're going to continue to see this youth population uh, uh, grow and enter adulthood. And in fact, when we talk about growth in the Hispanic population, here's what we project will happen by 2050. By 2050, we project the Hispanic population will be at 128 million nationwide. That makes up about 29% of the nation's population by 2050. So you can see that we have a lot of growth to come in the Hispanic population. I'd also stress that this growth, a lot of it, would ha is, it will happen even without further immigration because there's a sense that immigration has slowed to the United States. A lot of this is already going to happen because much of this is going to happen with people who are already here in the United States and births, frankly, are more important to Hispanic population growth than immigration. Um, one other interesting thing about Hispanics is how diverse they are. Um, as, as, as we were mentioning a little bit earlier, we published a report about Hispanics and identity. And one of the findings was that Hispanics prefer to be called by their country of origin names as opposed to being called Hispanic or Latino. Now we use Hispanic and Latino to, uh, as terms to describe this particular group and we also uh, use Hispanic and Latino in statistics that are published both by the federal government but also by social science researchers. But here you can see how diverse the community is. Um, Hispanics are dominated by Mexicans. 63% of the nation's Hispanic population is of Mexican origin. That's followed by Puerto Ricans at about almost 10%. Cubans and Salvadorans and then Dominicans, Guatemalans and Colombians, all with uh, nearly a million or more people. So you can see that the Hispanic population of the nation is fairly diverse. It also differs depending on what part of the country you're in. So in a place like Washington, D.C., for example, the dominant group there among Hispanics are Salvadoreños. Um, in New York, it's Puerto Ricans and Dominicans, and I'm sorry my Dominican number is not showing there. Um, in Miami, it's Cubans. In Los Angeles, it's Mexicans, but because there are so many Latinos in Los Angeles, there are actually more Salvadorans in the LA area than there are in Washington, D.C. And for the state of New Jersey, you can see its distribution here. Puerto Ricans are the largest group in the state of New Jersey, followed by Dominicans and Cubans. Mexicans at 14% are rising, um, but uh, they are still dwarfed by the Puerto Rican share in the state of New Jersey. Okay, I'm gonna talk about some national trends here. So that was all the demographics. There's a lot of interesting information there, and I think that this, the, as you can see, the demographic story about Latinos is really quite fascinating, interesting, and has many different components to it. But let's talk about a few other things that are happening, not just about the demographics, but also about economics, about education, about public opinion. So in terms of Hispanics and technology use, one of the interesting things is that Hispanics, more than any other group, are more likely to live in a household where there isn't a landline phone. They're cell phone only. Um, most recent statistics suggest that about 41% of Hispanic households only have a cell phone in them. They don't have a, a landline phone. Now for somebody who does public opinion research, this is, a, this is an important trend to note because if you want to survey Hispanics, you've got to have a cell phone component. So many of them are only going to be reached through a cell phone. This partly reflects youth, by the way, because Latinos are younger and young people are more likely to be cell phone only. But nonetheless, as you can see, Latinos have been in the lead in terms of being cell phone only households. Um, what about uh, participation in, in elections? There are more than 21 million Hispanics eligible to vote today in the United States. By eligible to vote, I mean they are 18 years of age and a US citizen. Now, that number's been rising and it's rising fast. Part of the reason why it's rising is because about every month, 50,000 young Latinos, if not more, uh, who are US born, turn 18. And this process has been going on for a decade now, and it's gonna continue to go on for another two to three decades. So every election cycle, there's a lot of new young Latinos who are gonna be first time voters entering into, the, entering into adulthood, coming of age, and becoming eligible to vote. You can see that the number of voters has also been increasing. So in 2008, there were nearly 10 million Hispanic voters nationwide. That means that the turnout rate was about 50%, but it was behind that of blacks and whites, which in 2008 was more like 66, 
So even though we've seen an improvement in Hispanic participation rates and the number of Hispanic voters, their participation rates are substantially below those of whites and blacks. One other interesting story that's been happening in trends is a story about education. And education for Latinos has always been a top issue in surveys that we have done. It's always come up as a top issue. But in, in, the last, um, in the last year or so, there's been a surge in college enrollments among young Latinos. And we now have a record number of 18 to 24 year old Latinos who are enrolled in college. Now this number shows you the share, this chart shows you the share of each group which is enrolled in college. Um, so the share of 18 to 24 year olds who are enrolled in college, you can see the Hispanic number has spiked in recent years, we're up to 32%. Still below that of Asians, whites, and blacks, but it is rising and it's rising fast. Um, one other interesting thing here is that, uh, is that in, um, in, if you take a look at enrollment numbers, uh, Hispanic young people are now the largest minority group on the nation's college campuses. Now that includes community colleges and four-year colleges, and if we just look at four-year colleges, African Americans are the largest minority group on college campuses. Even so, we've seen an increase in enrollments among young Latinos who are going to college. We've also seen an increase in the share of, of young Latinos completing high school, so they're also more eligible than ever. All very interesting. Uh, given some of the, g given the importance of education in the labor market. By contrast, if we take a look at poverty, however, um, we've seen the impact of the Great Recession in a number of ways on Latinos. In the terms of childhood poverty, the number of young Latinos who live in poverty now, the number of Latino children living in poverty, surpasses every other group. Prior to the recession, there were more white children living in poverty than any other group. But since the beginning of the recession, Hispanics have surpassed whites and blacks, and now, according to data from the U.S. Uh, for, from the U.S. federal government, um, there are now 6.1 million Hispanic children who live in poverty. And this is just using the official poverty measure. This is not using other measures that there might be out there, because there are different measures of poverty. Using the official measure, there are 6.1 million Latino children who live in poverty, more than any other group. When it comes to home ownership, the, the, the home ownership, uh, I'm sorry, the housing market boom um, uh, helped many Latinos uh, 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 buy a home. And we reached a peak in terms of home ownership in 2006 of almost 50% among Hispanic households in 2006. But since then, the number has dropped slightly to 47.4%. But this chart shows you the trends in home ownership. And as you can see, for Latinos, their home ownership rates are below those of Asians and also whites. In terms of wealth, the recession had a large impact on Latinos. Um, in terms of wealth, uh, Hispanics got hit harder than any other group. Um, this is based off of analysis we did of, of data from the federal government that suggests that Hispanics, in terms of their household wealth, lost 66% between 2005 and 2009. Um, that kind of brackets the recession, not exactly, but more than any other group, they saw their wealth numbers decline. Um, for Hispanics, wealth is oftentimes held in two forms, either in a home, they're homeowners, and so the decline in wealth is a reflection of where they live. They live in places where there, are, uh, where there was a big run up in housing prices and the big decline in housing prices. And we captured both of those in this data, the, the peak and the, the trough. Um, also, um, many Hispanics um, actually don't have a lot of wealth, and if they do, it's oftentimes in the form of a vehicle. Um, so when you take a look at Hispanic wealth overall, there really wasn't much of a change. So a lot of this is being driven by household, uh, the value of homes that many Latinos owned in places where there was a big run up in prices. In terms of the unemployment rate for both native-born and foreign-born Hispanics, you can see that the unemployment rate increased rapidly at the end of the recession. And it's now come down a little bit. These are quarterly unemployment, I'm sorry, annual unemployment rates. So it doesn't match the most recent numbers that you may see from the federal government, but it does give you a sense of sort of where we are for, for Latinos. Finally, I want to close by talking a little bit about identity and showing you some of our results from our recent survey. Um, when you ask Hispanics, about what they want to call, what they want to be called. How do they see their identity? This is, these are some results from a recent survey. This is what we found. Um, more than half, or I should say half of Hispanics, say they prefer to be called by their country of origin term first. They want to be called 
Cuban or Dominican or Mexican or Puerto Rican. That's what they want to be called, uh, that's what they use most often to describe themselves. 24% say that they describe themselves as Hispanic or Latino most often, and 21% say they describe themselves as American most often. Of course, these how people identify varies and differs according to immigrant generation. The first generation are people who are foreign born. And as you can see among them, perhaps unsurprisingly, 62% say they prefer to be called by their country of origin names, or that's what they use most often to describe themselves. But that share falls as we go through the generations. By the third generation, just 28% of Latinos, these are people who are US born with US born parents, uh, just 28% say they call themselves by their country of origin names. Now, uh, most often. Now, I'm one of those people. If you ask me, what am I? Um, I might say I'm Hispanic, I might say I'm Latino. More often than not, I'm gonna say that I am Mexican or Mexican-American or Chicano. Those are the terms I'm gonna use to describe myself. Um, about 48% of that group, the third generation, call themselves American most often. So as you can see, identity varies by immigrant generation and there are many different ways that Latinos identify themselves, what terms they use to describe themselves. Um, and I think it reflects the diversity of the community, all the different ways in which Latinos see themselves. It is interesting though that the federal government uh, in 1976 officially defined the term Hispanic and required that the term Hispanic be used in official statistics from the federal government. Uh, in 97, they add the term Latino to the list. Yet, uh, if you take a look at our report, you'll see the title of it is uh, When Labels Don't Fit. Um, and part of it is, is that many Latinos really haven't embraced these terms Hispanic or Latino. In response to our report, in response to these results, We've received a number of reactions from people, both in the press and the media, but also, I think interestingly, people who sent us emails telling us their story. And many people saw themselves in our results. Uh, many different types of people with different identities saw themselves in our results. Um, I got an email from somebody who said, I am, I am Costa Rican and that's what I tell everybody. Um, I got another email saying, I can't believe that Hispanics don't use the term Latino. Why aren't they using Latino? I thought Latino was the right term. And then we got emails saying, so which term is it, Hispanic or Latino? Um, so we got a variety of responses uh, to this, and I think it really reflects, again, the diversity of the community. But I really find the responses quite interesting. We've created a little bit of a discussion about identity based off this particular report. Speaking of Hispanic or Latino, we also asked Hispanics, which term do you prefer? Hispanic or Latino? Well, many of them say they don't care about either term. They have no preference. 51% half say they have no preference, and this has been stable over 10 years. If there is a preference, Hispanic is preferred over Latino, which a lot of people find this, this uh, finding surprising, that more Hispanics prefer the term Hispanic as opposed to Latino. Now, a little bit of history here. Um, the term Hispanic was defined by the federal government, so there's a, firm, there's a, there's a hard definition of that. Um, and um, the term Hispanic tends to be used more often on the East Coast or in Texas, particularly Florida and Texas. Latino, on the other hand, is something that came out of California, a reaction to the term Hispanic, an alternative term that was not assigned to the community or as a catch-all phrase uh, uh, because it was something that Latinos chose themselves to describe themselves. Um, yet it, was, it comes out of California in the West. So it's interesting to see these distributions, particularly across different geographies, you do see some differences. Um, finally, I wanna close by talking, uh, at least showing you a little bit about issues, because I know today we're gonna have some discussions about different issues of importance to the Latino community. Now we've been asking this question about how important is the issue of, and then we go through each one, how important is the issue of, say, jobs to you personally? Is it extremely important, very important, somewhat important, or not important at all? And in our surveys, we've continually gotten results like this. That is, it's usually jobs, education, or healthcare, which Latinos point to as their most important issues or issues they, they say are most important to them. Immigration, you'll see here, is on the list. Even though it's at the bottom of the list, I want to stress that immigration is no different from federal bu the federal budget deficit or taxes on this list because the numbers are very close. So statistically speaking, there's no difference. Um, but immigration has never rated as a top issue in our surveys. Now this is just among registered voters. We see something similar among all Latinos. Um, and I do want to stress as well that, e e that when it comes to immigration, on many policy issues regarding immigration, Latinos do have very strong opinions and different opinions in the general public. 
But when it comes to voting and how they vote, we have found that immigration has not necessarily been the driving factor for determining Latinos' votes. For some people, yes. But jobs in the economy or other factors are also important for Latinos, according to our, our, our surveys and our reports. So I'm going to end there. And I want to say that uh, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to speak, you, speak to you today. And of course, I'd be happy to answer any questions through the course of the day after our talk, after, uh, after uh, 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 our talk here. And of course, if you have uh, any uh, questions or you'd like to see some of the reports that this is based on, you can visit us at uh, pewhispanic.org. So thank you very much. Well, they're getting set up. Um, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about, uh, uh, about the Latino Information Network, which I run uh, here at Rutgers. It's a two-year project. Uh, it was started on the basis of, uh, predicated on the basis that, uh, like a lot of other organizations, we got tired of seeing a lot of the negative uh, press that the media was putting out in terms of Latinos and Hispanics around the country. And we thought that, that, that we needed something here at Rutgers that would tell an even keel, even, even you know, mannered, uh, uh, you know, an accurate kind of story uh, that, we could, uh, that we could put on a website. Uh, one of the first things that we did, however, was we tried to figure out how much Latino-related research was going on at Rutgers. And as you can imagine, where you've got uh, a, a campus that stretches from Camden to Newark, hopefully Camden is still in the picture today, uh, maybe not, depending on Christie. Uh, when you've got seven campuses, uh, you know, they, a lot of times they're very siloed. Uh, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. And so when we started doing a content assessment of what was Latino related uh, uh, around these campuses, we found that it, we thought when we first started there might be like half a dozen, eight different entities. And as it turns out, there's triple that many. There's actually about 26, 27 uh, different efforts that are going on, either by department, by project, by school. Uh, there's a, uh, an estimated 100 faculty members who are engaged in some kind of Latino research. So that was, you know, we're trying to capture into a database that we're going to put uh, into the Latino Information Network. In addition to that, uh, we're members of a consortium called the Inter University Program for Latino research. It's a consortium of now 25 organizations, including Rutgers, that are all the leading Latino research institutes from around the country. So what we're going to do is basically a little bit of what the Pew does, but we're going to try to draw information from all these uh, different institutes and put them on a repository that will be a platform and ultimately be a website that we'll launch hopefully sometime this summer. It's a huge undertaking, but it is what it is, and uh, the concept is, is something that has got considerable amount of support, so we're, we're going to head in that direction. Well, Mark took, took you through the national uh, overview in terms of Latinos, and I will walk you through the uh, uh, New Jersey numbers. I tend to step out from up behind the podium because I just like to be closer to the crowd. Um, all right, so, there we go, great start already. All right, here is the, uh, some of what Mark might, might have touched on a little bit. This is what New Jersey looks like now uh, as, as of the uh, 2000 census. Lower right-hand corner, you can see that Latinos you know, grew 39%. It isn't the 40% you know, that was on Mark's chart, but it's just about you know, right there. And if not for that growth, there would not have been any growth in New Jersey because the non-Latino population dropped by just slightly less than 1%. So we're largely responsible for whatever growth there was in the state of New Jersey. The other thing you'll notice 
is if you look at the shaded areas, you'll know that in the, if some of, the, some of you who are certainly from New Jersey will know that in the upper northwest corner of New Jersey, uh, Bergen, Hudson, Passaic, Essex, uh, Middlesex, you know, the, the, the six counties that, that are up in that northwest corner, those represent uh, 1.1 million of the 1.6 that are in New Jersey. But you see a dispersion into the southern you know, county, so you're starting to see some movement there. One of the things that Mark also touched on was the number of foreign, you know, foreign born, and certainly New Jersey is, is one of those states that probably more than any other state is, is a crossroads of all cultures, all Latino groups from all, all over Latin America, the Caribbean, Mexico, uh, Spain. Uh, there is no state that I know of that has as much diversity in terms of country of origin as, as New Jersey does. And you can see by the numbers here, uh, in terms of you know, what they represent as far as the total is concerned. You've got 600,000 that were foreign born, and those are the top 10 countries uh, in terms of the numbers that, you know, that have come into the state. Uh, you can barely see it up, but you can see that they have, they have migrated into those six counties plus one uh, in uh, Somerset. Uh, so as immigrants are going into northwest New Jersey, you've also got dispersion coming out of those counties moving southward. So there's a rolling effect in terms of you know, those the new, new uh, arrivals in and people who have been there uh, moving out into the rural area. <coughs> Every county in New Jersey saw some level of growth, some obviously more than others. Hudson County really you know, steps out there with a 42% growth, Passaic at 37, Union County 27, Essex at 27, those are all part of what I call the big six. Those are all in the northwest corner of New Jersey. Right? And so those continue to grow at a fast rate. And so, but you know, even at, you, if you look at any county, there's 21 there. Every single one saw some level of growth. I also have some quick facts on New Jersey. Mark touched on it, seventh rank, as far as you know, the uh, population in, in the state. Uh, we estimate that by uh, uh, 2020, there'll be 2.2 million. Uh, a lot of Latinos under the age of 18. It's very young, as you can see, 37%. Uh, when you look at the enrollments in K through 4 and all the way through from, you know, from K through 4 to, to 12, uh, the, the numbers as you get down into the lower grades get larger. Uh, so you know, this is a, uh, a, a, a reaction or you know a, a result that you're going to continue to see as far as you know student enrollments are concerned in New Jersey for years to come so I I tell the administration here your clientele is changing number the, the type of people that you're needing to recruit and to bring into Rutgers is changing you know they're out there you know where are they going to go to school so they're right there right before our eyes and in a very short period of time one in four is going to become one in three out of every you know, school you know, uh, classroom you know, seat that's taken up by a Latino. However, when you look at, at uh, achievement as far as you know, uh, uh, education is concerned, we lag, uh, uh, sadly, uh, when you compare bachelor's degrees to the general population, especially the whites, we're, we're half the, you know, the rate you know, that, that others are right, at the state level. For, and at, at, the, at the graduate and professional level, uh, it's just as bad. So we have some work to do in terms of education, for sure. Now, some people you know, you know, want to get a sense as to how much New Jersey has changed in just 10 years. This, this will give you just a, a, a graphical look in terms of the percentages and how, how much the, you know, the state has changed in terms of the makeup. Puerto Ricans were 53%. Now they're almost at half of that rate. That doesn't mean that the number of Puerto Ricans has dropped. It's only the percentage you know, has dropped, but uh, you can see that there's much more div uh, diversity, diversity and, and variety in terms of everybody who is, who's represented in this chart. You can see here numerically, uh, again, at the top, Puerto Ricans are the largest group. They grew about the slowest. Actually, actually Cubans at the bottom grew, grew the slowest. They, you know, Cubans actually have been dropping off you know, for for the last you know, couple of uh, decennials. 
but you can see the growth among Mexicans, Dominicans, Salvadorians, the rest of the groups there. Note especially Mexicans and Guatemalans and Dominicans in terms of the numbers, the jumps. Uh, you've got, you know, in, in, for example, in, among Mexicans, 217,000. A lot of what, we, you know, what we're calling the unauthorized or undocumented workers in New Jersey, and there are a good number, a goodly number. We don't know how many, but we think that that number, 217, is closer to 300,000. And we may even be conservative on that, on that estimate. And that'll come into play later when I talk about some other issues. But, so you've got almost 300,000, let's say, for Mexicans today. In 1990, the number of Mexicans in this state was less than 30,000. Less than 30,000. So it has grown 10 times in the span of 20 years. Why? Uh, most likely because there's available jobs, service jobs, agricultural jobs, uh, jobs that are low paying, uh, but you know, obviously the border has moved north. And it's north of New Jersey now. And by the time you figure 300,000 are here in Mexicans in, in New York, there's probably another six or 700,000. There's a, over a million in the corridor between Philadelphia and, and, uh, and, and New York. This will give you a, pl a breakdown in terms of where the people were born. Uh, you can see that a lot, you know, a goodly number again, uh, you know, at uh, uh, almost 54%, uh, 55% of our foreign born, actually, and, and were born in another state, it's even higher. Uh, but the foreign born really are, are the ones that, you know, that really influence a lot of what's going on in terms of the uh, demographics in New Jersey. Median age, it's a little bit higher here only because the number of people who migrate into New Jersey tend to be from South America, Central America, tend to be a lot of people who are also not necessarily like, like Mexican migrants would be who are agrarian you know, background, uh, you know, more you know, uneducated you know, kinds of folks that, that are looking for you know, those you know, kinds of jobs, low paying jobs. Uh, I mean, they love to get paid higher, but they, they're, they're, they get attracted because of the low-paying jobs. Uh, but the people who come in from, you know, from, uh, from South America, you know, for example, uh, usually have resources. And so that level of resources, along with their education, you know, pumps up the age a, a little bit in the state, but it's not dramatically different than what it is around the country where it's usually in the, in the ballpark of 28, 29 years of age. English, in terms of the ability to speak English, uh, you know, it, it, you could take it as a good story, bad story, but you know, for the most part, uh, we've got almost 70% who, who speak the language in some form, you know, either well, uh, you know, or well, very well. You know, so that's not a bad story, uh, but you, know, you still have enclaves here in, in New Jersey, you know them, right here in New Brunswick, uh, on French Street, uh, Perth Amboy, Passaic, Patterson, Hudson, where you don't need English to get around. You can, you can survive on a day-to-day -day basis just simply with, you know, with the Spanish language. Right? So there, there are certainly enclaves that are going to cling to the Spanish, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I, my prof, one of my professors used to tell me, you know, if you speak three languages, you're trilingual. If you speak two, you're bilingual. And if you speak one, then you must be an American. <laughs> yeah? So that's the way that one goes. All right, this one is a sort of a good news, bad news kind of story. You've got the number of Latinos who are working. The working rate is almost at 72% among Latinos in the state of New Jersey. The national average is around 67%. So we're almost five percentage points higher than what Latinos work at the rate that they work in any other place around the country. And if you look at it in terms of the overall rate uh, for, uh, for New Jersey at 67.4 there, uh, again, we're talking almost five percentage points or f a full five percentage points difference, all right? So work ethic is not a, a question here. It's not, it's not one of those things that you, know, that you have to worry about. However, the question I raise is this is for 16 and over. 
So the question I ask is how many 16, 17, and 18 year olds are working either because they have to or because they, you know, peer pressure, they want material goods or, you know, they want what they want, they drop out of school, they're working, and they're lost. And, and, and they're working, it's a good thing, yes, but they're losing out on education and the more education in this country, obviously, you have, uh, the better off you are, you know, financially. So it translates. But this is a sort of a good news, bad news kind, you know, kind of a story when I look at it. Um, Mark touched on this in terms of ownership. Uh, it's uh, the inverse uh, as far as Latinos versus the, uh, the, the general population. Uh, we tend to, uh, to uh, rent uh, a lot more than, than, uh, than own. Uh, and some, some people would look at this as being a negative and I say to them, how much does it cost to rent a two, two bedroom apartment in New Jersey? 750, 1,000, who's paying that? Who are they paying it to? I doubt that they're paying it to Latino, you know, landowner, or land, you know, or you know, ten, uh, you know, landholder, or you know, person who owns landlord that you know that owns that property. I doubt it. Yeah. So there's a real estate industry that depends largely on on the people who are renting in this state, uh, and we we happen to be you know a big factor in that area, just like blacks are. Uh, it, it's a similar story among you know people who are black or African American, uh, but I, it's a it's a it's a story that it's a contribution either way whether you're owning or whether you're renting, you're fueling something in the economy, you're paying something into the economy. Speaking of the economy, when we look at a median household incomes, I took a look at you know from 1980 all the way up to 2009, and I took a look at what. Latinos were making on a year-to-year -year kind of basis. And you can see that uh, in red there, or rather uh, in green, it should be in green, sorry, I got the colors mixed up up there. Uh, you know, they're, they're in the uh, $38,000, $40,000 range, right, nationally. So keep that number in mind when you look at this number, all right? There is a growing middle class in New Jersey, unlike any other probably around in the states. Um, it's getting wider. The, it, the girth of this, of, this, of this middle class is getting wider. It's getting deeper. And I'll show you a stat here in a minute. But it's $10,000 higher here than it is you know, with the national average. Right? So why is that? Well, you know. You know yourself. You live in New Jersey, it takes money to live in New Jersey. You gotta make money, you know, and you know, to survive. And, and so here, yeah, we'll make, we'll make a higher wage, but we'll spend it just as fast as we get it. You know, because we've got bills, we've got mortgages, we've got other kinds of payments, you know, that we gotta take care of. But still, at a household income of 48,000, it's 10,000 higher than the, at the national average, but still 20,000 lower than it is at, you know, when you compare it to, uh, to uh, whites. Uh, in, the, in the state of New Jersey. People love to talk about, you know, the, uh, the, the amount of spending. Uh, some people refer to this as purchasing power. And, yeah, you can see that, you know, starting in 1990, we, we started to take off, you know, at $200 billion thereabouts, right? And you can see that it's jumped all the way to, you know, we expect to, to be spending by 2015, one point you know, five trillion dollars a year in retail spending. All of a sudden, we've become the corporate darlings of America because we love to spend. We're voracious spenders, right? And some people call this purchasing power. I don't. I call it indiscriminate spending. It's only power if you can leverage it and you can use it in some form or fashion. How can you have a company that's a conglomerate come into your neighborhood, into your community, sell their products, siphon off the revenue, and head off, you know, you know, off to another, into another market without at least holding them accountable, you know, for what they're doing in your community? We need to be represented at the table. We need to be represented on boards. It's not purchasing power in my book. It's indiscriminate spending. Still, it's a, an impressive number. In New Jersey, we're doing you know, our share. You know, we rank right there you know, at the top you know, in, in the uh, sixth position at 
This is a, a numbers, you know, for, uh, for 2010 at 39, but we expect by two, 2015 to, you know, to jump up to $55 billion a year in retail spending. It's a good jump, healthy jump. So this is not us lallygogging around as consumers. We're in the game. We've got skin in the game. We're making contributions to the economy. We're fueling the economy. We're spending money in New Jersey. And merchants should be, you know, should be happy that we're around. Right? You can see the dramatic growth over the years in terms of the red, you know, just how, how fast the, uh, the amount of spending has grown in New Jersey. It's impressive. It is. But again, is it purchasing power or is it indiscriminate spending? Here's a graph that I want you to take away, and I think it's the beginning of what I will, you know, call, you know, I'm starting to call a potential perfect storm in New Jersey for, for Latinos. And that, you know, this is good news, bad news kind of thing. You've got to have both. That's why we call it an even keel, even handed approach to handling the, you know, the numbers. You can see by what I said earlier that the amount, the number of people who are doing better in blue, you know, who are part of the, the growing middle class is certainly growing and they're, they're making a lot of money and, and the number of people who are, you know, who are in that group is also growing. You know, so that's a good story, right? In the red are all the people who live in poverty in New Jersey. All the people who live in red are in poverty. The yellow are people who are within $15,000 of, of, you know, dropping off into that chasm called poverty. $15,000. You're only $15,000 away from living as, as you know, someone that, that would be considered living in poverty. So when you take the yellow and the red and you combine them together, that totals out to 166 thousand families in New Jersey that are Latinos that are that are living under these conditions and potentially on the edge you know making you making men, ends meet so you know for me this is this is you know yeah I, I, I love the fact that there's a growing middle class and that's responsible you know for that forty eight thousand dollar household median income but you know, my, my greater concern is you know, for the folks that live in, in this area of the red and the yellow. Uh, and that's going to prove to be a challenge for all of us as we get down the road. Uh, another thing that I also like to, like to touch, it also shows that we've got you know, so-called skin in the game, is uh, you know, in the area of Latino-owned businesses. This is not 2007 numbers. So the jump in, in the number of Latino-owned businesses was 37 percent just in a five-year span. So that's over that's over five percent per you know per year growth. That's a pretty fast clip. That's just before we hit the recession uh, period between 2007 and 2009. Right? So we were growing at a pretty fast clip. But even 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 so, and and these uh, 68,000 businesses were churning out 10.5 billion dollars in sales receipts. That's sales. Again, this is taxed at the state, at the federal level. That's what contributions. We're not lollygagging around. We're entrepreneurial. We show that we're entrepreneurial. You know, we've got over 70,000 here, you know, that, you know, businesses that are, that are clocking. We've got estimated because those numbers were in 2007, and they're now, of course, it's almost five years later. Uh, we think that that number is closer to now to 75,000 even despite the recession. Uh, and this is because we've talked to a number of city managers from around uh, the state uh, trying to get a fix in terms of uh, where they see growth, and a lot of them have seen growth in, in, in this area. It's at, at a slower clip than what it was between 2002 and 2007, but it's there nonetheless. The other thing that they've also noted is that, uh, and this I got from the census in, New York, uh, in, uh, in Washington, uh, Probably one in three, uh, if not a higher number, and we'll find out after they do the uh, 2012 survey, 30% uh, or, or more are being started by Latinas. So you show, you, you're, you're seeing some, some level of empowerment among Latina entrepreneurs as well, which is also a good thing. This is where, you know, I start worrying. The percentage of Latinos who are living in poverty is at 20%. It translates out to about 320,000 people. 
If you take 1.6, multiply it times the number, that's what you're talking about, 320,000 people. Number of Latino youth in, in poverty, it's 121,000. Huge number. We represent 30% of all, all, all people living in poverty. And it's mostly, you know, it's, it's hitting a lot of Latino women households. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty sad kind of story. When you look at it numerically, you start making some comparisons. Here's how it breaks out in terms of age groups. If you took the red, which is the total number, and if it was a city unto itself, it would be the largest city in New Jersey by 50,000. Newark is at around 275, 280. That number represents the largest city in New Jersey if, you, if it were a city unto itself. You see the number of people who are under 18 who are poor, you know, who are living in poverty. That's almost 50% you know, higher than what the whole state of, of the population of, of Trenton, the state capital is, just to give you a, a perspective. That in and of itself, Latino youth in the, in, the, in, the, in the state would rank as the fifth largest city in the state. It gives you some sense of scope as to how deep this, pro this problem really runs. Here's the other half of the equation, the, the bad equation, is that 30% of all Latinos are without some kind of Latino health care coverage. That translates out to almost a half million people. It's an incredible number. Out of the 1.6 million, almost a half million are living without some kind of health coverage. And we represent, again, an, an, uh, a huge percentage, you know, way out of line percentage so compared to what our population is in terms of what that, what that level of, uh, you know, lack of insurance coverage, you know, you know, rep, you know it is in the state. You can see from uh, 2000 to 2012, it's an estimate, but it's grown, it's almost doubled. It's almost doubled. So the number of people who continue, you know, to fall into, into, into uh, a state where they're not covered by health insurance. Or these are people who, in my mind, are one accident, one disaster away from a catastrophe. Yeah? Because they're either poor or they're not covered. They can't cover their bills if, they, if something you know, bad was to happen to them as far as you know, the, uh, the, uh, the numbers are concerned. So when I look at the, the combine of the two, uh, I, I call it, you know, it you know, it's a perfect storm, but it's a bad kind of storm, obviously. You take the 320, you take the 480, there's obviously some overlap. The less money you make, the less likely you are to, you know, to have health coverage. That's a given. The number of you know, immigrants that we have in the state is high, so those, num those people are li most likely not to have health coverage as well. So that's another factor you know, in there as well. What is not factored into this, what is not factored into the numbers, that any of the numbers that I've given you here, is the level of undocumented workers that there are in the state of New Jersey. So if you've got this and this, and then you've got undocumented as well, you've got one hell of a chore, a challenge, in terms of trying to figure out how to, how to you know, provide health care uh, and how to keep people out of poverty you know, in New Jersey. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tough story, but uh, it's, it's, it's better that you know that you don't know. So. Uh, the other thing that I would say, you know, that, you know, and, and I'll, maybe I'll, I'll touch on it, you know, during our, our Q&A discussion is on the, on the voter registration, you know, thing is, is that, yeah, we're, we've got 10,000 people who are voting, right? But you see that it's only half of the people who are registered. We're leaving political capital on the table. We're absolutely leaving political capital on the table. And we've got to do a better job of, you know, getting out the vote. Uh, some people ask, is there a Latino vote? I don't know whether there is or there isn't. But we need to exercise uh, our, our God-given rights as Americans or Mexican-Americans or Cuban-Americans or whatever Americans, you know, to get out to the polls, which, whatever, however we can. That 10,000 number just doesn't cut it for me. And I think it doesn't cut it, and it shouldn't cut it for you either. So with that little, you know, uh, editorial, I'll... Uh, uh, we'll start it off with you know, maybe a little bit of Q&A and take some questions and then, um, uh, and then we'll uh, get on to the next part of the show. Yes, sir. I'm wondering if you 
In Middlesex? Um, if you think the other counties do that, uh, Middlesex, Union, Somerset. Well, the, the, the numbers, you know, certainly are, 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 are growing. Uh, the impact, um, it's, it's hard to, you know, other than from an economic point of view, uh, it's, it's hard to tell you whether politically it means anything or not because you haven't seen any increase in terms of elected officials in, in, those, in those counties other than in Perth Amboy, where you've got now a, a Puerto Rican you know, uh, woman that's the first ever in, in the state of New Jersey that's a, a Latina who's, who's been elected to office. So uh, the impact uh, probably now is, is, is really uh, a little bit hard to read in the sense that, yeah, we know the numbers. Uh, we know there's a lot of uh, you know, a mixture as far as the, the, the types of people that are coming in. And certainly Middlesex, you've got a lot of Oaxacanos and people from Michoacan, Mexicans, you know, that, that are certainly settling here in New Brunswick, Perth Amboy, uh, you know, Hudson, you know, get, you know, gets a little bit of everything. Uh, so the, so the, the, uh, the, 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 the groupings there are, are, you know, quite varied as far as Hudson is concerned. Uh, most of it, I think, is just, you know, in the form of assimilation and trying to get adjusted to what's going on here in the United States and trying to figure out how to get a, gain a, a, you know, a firm a firm foothold uh, and, and trying to make, you know, make ends meet, you know, while they established themselves. Yes, sir. Um, do you know if you have any, uh, this uh, has a data on registered voters and in terms of Hispanic, you know, the registered voters is worse broken down by you know, state and county and cities and so forth. Because most of the, the data that you can get out of uh, registered voters is right. actually from private vendors. And, right. and, and I wonder if there is a serious study that can with the institution, not non commercial that would gather that kind of information. Um, we're doing some work at the Latino Information Network in terms of trying to gather some of that in, in, in pre preparation for, for the elections. But Bruni Sanchez from the census is here, and, and uh, Bruni has a good firm fix on, on the, you know, pot, you know. Monday. Monday is the data released, um, interactive maps, where you can access data um, in 2008, 2010 elections, and you'll know by race. With a, with a little bit of work, you can actually drill down into the census data and, and figure out by polling district who voted, who didn't vote, who's registered, who's not registered. That takes a lot of work, but you know, whether, you know that's where the rubber hits the road. I mean, if you want to get people out, uh, that's where it starts. You've got to be able to, you know, to really d drill down and do some of that work. Now, we're going to do some of that work, uh, but we can't do it by ourselves. And so I'll, you know. The other question is, do you have any, uh, have you considered or have you done the poverty breakdown by a country of origin, uh, especially, you know, the difference between the percentage of foreign born, first, second, and third generation, just to see the kind of impact that, that poverty, uh, the, the kind of impact that the, the length of time in the country has on the poverty level? Of the there, there is information of that breakdown. Mark could probably touch on that some. I yeah, there certainly is a connection between length of time in the country that, a, that an immigrant has been in the country and also uh, the, the poverty rate of the family. So there is a link. The longer the time here, the, the better the, the individual is doing. But there's a couple of things to be aware of. On the one hand, when you're talking about people who have been in the country longer, there are people who, who quote, unquote, uh, stayed here, who have, who, have, who have been in the United States for a number of years. People who may have had difficulties um, succeeding in the U.S., may have left. And so those who were 
uh, who were struggling may have decided to return to their home countries. So we got a little bit of a selection effect in terms of longer here in the U.S., lower poverty rate. It's unclear what all the connections are, but that's just the, the basic facts in terms of the data. Anybody else? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, unauthorized is actually the term that the federal government uses to describe people who are in the country without authorization. And I know there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of discussion about which is the right term to use. Is it an illegal immigrant? Is it undocumented immigrant? Is it an authorized immigrant? We use unauthorized because that's what the, that, that, those, that's the definition the federal government uses. Undocumented is, is something that we have used in the past, but sometimes you can have uh, somebody who is U.S. born who is undocumented. So it may not be as precise of a, of a term. And in terms of illegal immigrant, um, uh, we have not used the term illegal immigrant in our publications. We've used either undocumented or unauthorized. There's some news organizations that are comfortable in using illegal aliens. Uh, it depends on, on uh, how many notches to the right of center you might be. There's other organizations that, that choose to use undocumented, and yet there's other groups, like Mark says, that, that use unauthorized. And, and some of it is, is, is based on, you know, the or news organizations use what they call style books and standards, you know, in terms of how to, how to, uh, to treat uh, people of color or uh, people who are, you know, who may be undocumented. Und undocumented is a little bit softer than, say, saying illegal. You know, and, and uh, it, it almost has political connotations when you refer to them as the illegals in some corners. Sure. All right. You got one more question? One more, one more question. If you guys can take this, or Larry, if you want to take it, or somebody else, um, you know, from one of the organized bodies, just if you guys could make a statement about the impact you hope that the information you present here today will have, like, what do you hope people will go out from here and do with this information? Our executive uh, director, Michael Rickard, should probably speak to this. Uh, but essentially, the, the Hall Institute is, is about the exchange of information about critical issues that affect all of us. So I guess the, the real impact that we're looking for is to just have more information about this at all levels. Um, obviously, you, you have a, a large large group of people who are making a significant impact in every aspect of society. Um, and uh, people should know more about them. And particularly in the future, since New Jersey is growing, the population is growing, and, and things always change. So that's what the Hall Institute does, is get just folks like, like everybody here just to talk about it. And hopefully, solutions move to the top. I would, I would maybe step it up one, one notch and say, look, you can't make informed decisions. You can't be, you know, formulating public policy uh, unless you're, you know, you're an informed individual in terms of what groups uh, are and what they represent. And even amongst ourselves, a sense of perspective, either historical or local. Um, I'm not saying it derisively, but I, you know, I, I often like to say, People don't know what they don't know. And I get a lot of people who say to me, often after, after a presentation, they'll come up to me and say, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And OK, so now you know. What are you going to do with it? You know, then run with it. You know, you, those of you who are community leaders, who are community activists, who are uh, whatever in your communities, uh, now understand a little bit better, I hope, in terms of what we look like. But there's, you know, it goes deeper than this. There's a lot more information. And I, again, it goes back to the public policy issue. You can't make an informed decision unless you're, you're up, up to stuff in terms of what the data represents. Actually, we have to hold the questions for I wonder how much of this information from your uh, department share with the Health Research Center. Um, Health Research Center, as you know, is in charge of workforce development. Very involved in workforce development, uh, 
State Program Training Commission. And in 25 years that I served there, uh, Hispanic issues have been, I mean, Hispanic transportation has been totally uh, ignored. I don't know the word that I should use, but. Um, uh, I, I don't know, Bob? Let's call it invisible. Well, uh, in the health center. Yeah. Uh, well, but this week, this week we had we, we had uh, we had Edwin Melendez, you know, the director of the uh, Centro, you know, for Puerto Rican Studies at, at Hunter College in New York, to come in to speak about low wages and and the report that he and uh, uh, Dr. Ann Visser had done, uh, and the turnout there was less than 50 people. It was it was sad, and this is a guy who's done a lot of re research. Um, maybe it wasn't well or organized or, or well promoted, or whatever the case might be. Uh, I know that in two weeks, the Heldrich is, is having a workforce di uh, diversity conference where they're going to focus specifically on the Latino mu uh, market because I'm going to be the moderator at that particular you know conference. So we're getting we're getting around. We're starting to get the word out. You know I. It's a good time to be a Latino in, in this state or anywhere in the United States. It really is. But it only is a good thing to, you know, to be a Latino if you do something about it. Those of us who've got gear, who've got education, who've got intellect, who've got something to offer have got to put it back in some form or another. And so we'll, we're doing it, Mark and I are doing it as Chicanos from an informational point of view. We educate. We try to, you know, spread, you know, our mirth wherever we go. And by the way, we were both at one point six foot two. But this, this, when you work with statistics, it, it makes you short and squatty. Uh, Wait a minute. I know. I'm glad you're here with me, Mark. I, I'm feel tall now. You know. Uh, uh, now, I we, we we thank you for the opportunity to you know to to you know to uh, you know, to give you you know what we think is is you know, good, even-handed, even-keel kinds of information. We try not to lean one way or the other too much. It's hard not to when, when you see you know, things like poverty and people without health care coverage. Uh, you know, I, I get angry about it. But you've got you to gotta get settled, and you've got to be civil, and you've got to be tactful. Uh, you know, but more than anything else, we've got to be decisive. Thank you.